Welcome to Networking Field Day 14. We are here at Juniper Networks. The presentation that you are about to watch is being attended by an invited group of delegates who are here to ask questions, make comments, and offer their opinions about the technology and solutions that Juniper will present. If you'd like to learn more about this event, go to our website at techfieldday.com. Check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash techfieldday. My name is Guru Shanoi, and uh, I'm Director of Product Management, responsible for Juno Software, a large part of which is automation, virtualization, and programmability. So what I'm going to do now is uh, hone in on one of the things that uh, Nitin mentioned as part of our software vision, which is the cloudification and automation. We see them as very interrelated. Uh, and go a little deeper into what <coughs> the vision is that's driving uh, our automation effort, and what are the things we are doing to uh, actually enable our customers today as well, right? Because uh, there's two things. One, from a vision perspective, um, you know, we look at what is the what is the ultimate ideal for a network, uh, and it is to be self-driving. And a self-driving network is the ideal that we are working towards. Uh, and the analogy is very much like a self-driving car, right? Uh, ideally, when you get into a car, if you just want to go somewhere, say I want to go to San Francisco, and then sit and do your thing, and the car takes you there, uh, mends itself if there's a problem on the way, fills up gas itself. I don't know. It might do all of these things. Really, what your end goal is to accomplish getting to a place. It would be nice if networks could get to that point. If I want to set up connectivity between my you know, Sunnyvale and Boston offices, ideally, I just say, I want to set up a connectivity for my engineering teams between these two offices. And everything that happens at the back end, right, the, the access connectivity, the overlay secure tunnels that go maybe across the internet or a third, provide, third party MPLS provider, uh, connecting to data centers, all of that network establishment ideally should happen on its own. <coughs> we are far from there, right? That's the vision we are working towards, and it's definitely a journey of a thousand steps. So what we are focusing on is how do we break this down into building blocks that we can make progress on today, progress which our customers can realize immediate benefits out of, uh, while also you know, keeping in mind where we want to be headed. Right, so that's the goal. And there are three fundamental building blocks. Did you have a question? No, 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 I was just, just looking at the diagram. Okay, so I'll go over this you know, very briefly. There's three parts when we look at the building blocks. First of all, to be able to make any kind of um, you know, decisions, we need a lot of information. And that's where telemetry comes into play. So just like on a self-driving car, you have the thing at, on the top, the LIDAR, that's collecting information extremely rapidly, uh, fresh information for split-second decision-making you need mechanisms for telemetry that give you information in real time, very fast, and, and lots of it, right? SNMP doesn't cut it anymore. You know, you're not, if you're driving a car and you say, every five minutes I'll go and check how far is the other car ahead, you're probably going to be in deep trouble very fast. So same thing applies to networks, right? So you need streaming telemetry now. You need the network to tell you what's going on almost continuously in, in great detail. So that's the first part, streaming telemetry. The second building block is, of course, all that telemetry needs to be ingested somewhere up top. You need a collector. You need to be able to analyze that data, so you need analytics engines. You need to be able to apply rules and policies to that information. You might even need things like machine learning, AI kind of tools, right? But you need to be able to process all that information in the second building block, which is the control slash orchestration piece. And then there's the third building block, which is once you've decided what you need to do with that information, you need to communicate your intent back into the network. And so there are communication protocols that come into play when you communicate intent into action. And the devices must be able to translate that intent into specific things to do, right? So that's the third building block, which is how can devices be crafted to convert intent into actions? Now. Streaming telemetry is something I mentioned. You know, uh, you probably heard a lot about it. The beauty of this architecture and this vision is that we don't have to wait to achieve the end goal of a self-driving network to really leverage a lot of what's going on. Because all of these things by themselves, as we make progress collectively as Juniper as, and as an industry, our customers can realize immediate benefits as well in better network operations, uh, you know, running networks more efficiently and things like that. So what I'm going to do is not focus so much on the control and service orchestration piece of this. You know, that's a topic for another day. 
but I will focus on the work that we have been doing to lay the foundations here at the device level. Right? What are we doing for streaming telemetry? What are we doing with respect to being able to translate intent into actions by means of device models? Uh, and I will particularly emphasize on things that is actually already shipping right, very recently as, as of last quarter. So none of what I will talk about next is things that are in the distant future, but there are things in Juno's products. You can download, if you have a Juniper product, you can download the latest image or we can give you a VMX and you can try all of this stuff. So just a quick question about the device models. Is that, mm -hmm. in a specific device, is that within the Juniper family? Is that within anything? Could that be infrastructure? Could that be, you know, VMs? How, how broad or narrow <coughs> is the, the, the focus of that device model definition? Yeah, so it applies to everything that we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. Juno software that goes on our switching, routing, security products, including our virtual products. So I'll talk a little bit about it. So f for okay. example, if sure. we are saying a device is represented by a set of models, and that's what represents an MX device, for example. It's the same set of models that will represent a virtual MX. Okay. Right. So we, we are really looking at it as spanning across our products, but it doesn't stop there because, uh, you know, when we talk about models, in the end, uh, as, as an end consumer, a network device is just an abstraction. It's just a sum of its config and state to you, right? The fact that there's other things in it, physical things in it, doesn't really matter when you're at the end user level when you're trying to trying to uh, you know enforce some intent into the network if you're a controller or a management entity all you are all that is visible to you is really the config and state right so what what if you had the um, had the ability to model all of that config and state and why are models important because uh, if you if you want to enforce any kind of config or read any kind of state from the network if it's maintained in a proprietary manner that needs a lot of um, you know, crunching or scraping, et cetera, to be able to do anything useful with it, then it's not very machine-to-machine -machine friendly. Right? CLI, for example, very good for humans, but really poor when it comes to machine-to-machine -machine interactions. If you want to have multiple components, like controllers on top, that need to talk to devices at the bottom, you need to have some kind of a contract that the both ends understand. And ideally, if this contract is multi-vendor, then it makes it even easier for all these pieces from different vendors to talk to each other. Right? And that's why, first of all, models are important, because they give you that contract that you can exchange with some controller or orchestrator on top. And secondly, you know, that's the models that I was referring to, Juno's Yang models in particular. But there are standard models that are also emerging now. Open Config, for example, they are defining models that um, essentially should be the representation of a device. And if every vendor implements those, then you have multi-vendor model support. So you raise an interesting point there. Does that mean you're either, you either are, have multi-vendor support or you are working towards that goal as part of this architecture? Yes. Since most you know, environments are heterogeneous now? Yes. Okay. So the primary goal that we have in Juniper is standards first. So if there is a standard, we will adhere to that first. So for example, in the case of models, we did not have standard models for the longest time, right? How do you represent BGP on a router? How do you represent VLAN, you know, policies, et cetera? So we created our own, and we wrote them in Juno's DDL. Uh, and DDL incidentally became Yang when, you know, we, we contributed it to ITF. Now, you know, there are industry initiatives like OpenConfig that are saying, hey, let's define what a BGP model or what a route policy model looks like and ask all the vendors to adhere to it. So we are doing that now. So as of three months back, we released our official support in production for OpenConfig. And for us, it's a mapping exercise from OpenConfig to our models, because we've always inherently been Yang model driven. Right? So that building block has always been there in Juniper. What we're doing now is mapping it to what the industry is providing. IETF is working on models. There are lots of drafts out there that are in various stages of maturity. So we support that. And the cool thing here is, because we have Yang models at the back end, you can actually bring your own. You can say, my configuration on a certain device needs to look like this. My VLAN definition or my whatever definition needs to look like this. And you can write yourself, or we'll write for you, a translation engine that maps that model to ours. And that's a capability that we will demonstrate today, because this now really makes it powerful. You can choose the standard models that are already out there. If they don't work for you, then go ahead and extend it with your own, and we'll support that.
So, so models are certainly important, and I think it's the first step. But for me, you know, we've been going down this automation path for, for a little bit now. Right. And the, the, the challenge that we face is, is, is not even the modeling, it's this idea of services, right? right? So, so putting configuration on a device, getting the config to the device is relatively easy. Right. It's, it's maintaining the state of a service mm -hmm. that's relating and, and relating that configuration back to the service yes. that you have to have something that's doing that. Yes. And today we're trying to do that in the orchestration layer, but I think there, I think that the, the network itself, the network configuration is going to have to, to try to align uh, the configuration back to the service provides some mechanism Correct. to help us align that, yes. uh, especially as we try to do things like you know uh, multi-vendor support, you right. know, and, and moving services yeah. around. And, and that's a great point because <clears throat> models don't just mean you stop at the device layer, right? So in the previous picture here, what happens at the service layer also can be modeled. And here things are a little behind as an industry. You know, IETF has defined a few service models, for example, there's an LTVPN service model that we were recently reviewing that seems to be moving forward. Uh, so even the service end-to-end -end can be modeled, and then you map that model into the device model and say, okay, what this service means uh, is a set of these device configs, which are also modeled. So you absolutely need to have models at both places, and yeah, depending on the layer that you're working at, one would be more important than the other from your perspective. And, and in that model for the services, are they kind of maintain? I call it state. Are they yeah. kind of maintaining the state of that configuration um, in, in, in the model? Yes. So models are, some of the emerging models like open config define both config and state as part of the same block, right? So you, you configure something and then if you read back, you, you'll, you'll essentially within that model, there will be state information as well. And the same would have to apply to service models for maximum effectiveness. And then that's one part of it, the models. And, and then the other part is the communication protocols, right, which are machine-to-machine -machine friendly. Again, <clears throat> CLI, a lot, lot more clunky. But uh, there's things like NetConf, gRPC, thrift-based frameworks that are uh, different kinds of communication protocols with different encodings underneath them as well, right? You can exchange the information in JSON or XML or you know, Google Protobufs. So what we do is we take an agnostic approach to this, and we say, we don't know who's gonna use what. Some people may prefer thrift, others may prefer gRPC, that seems to be very popular right now, or a lot of the service providers of old have just been using NetCon, for example, right? And they wanna continue using that because they have tooling and other things. So we support that as well. So it's a combination of both having the right models in place uh, and the right communication protocols to integrate with the pieces on top that might be Juniper provided or third party provided, right? We, we realize that we live in a world where there's a lot of innovation happening around us and we need to be able to participate in that and enable that as well. Uh, and the key thing is extensibility and there's two dimensions to it. One is the ability to support custom models and the other is where you don't have models, this is basically management plane API. If you don't have capabilities that are offered to you by this, what then can Juniper provide to allow you to still extend the capabilities or use capabilities that are not necessarily offered by this? And that's something I'll talk about later. Uh, but we'll switch over to a demo relatively quickly on how we support Yang models and especially the ability to ingest any arbitrary you know, custom model and translate it back into Junos. And I'll just quickly go over the steps. All of the Yang models we have, we've been publishing them on uh, our website for the last two years. Uh, these are also available from the device. You just issue a query and you can get these models back. Uh, and then we also have the ability to take third-party Yang models. So you can define your own in Yang, the language, put it on a router along with a translation script to map the model that you've defined to the model that we have. That translation script could come from us as well. Uh, and again, the, end, the goal of this is to be able to work with the device in the way you want to, right? If existing ways of configuring the device don't work for you, you have a slightly different way of doing things because you are defining your service in a slightly different way, you can define that model and the router will understand it. You don't need to reboot the router and other things. These are literally drop-ons packages that go on the router. Um, and this is just the whole workflow. Right, so what happens once you have actually put the model on the router? What's happening after that, if you want to configure something, you do your configuration, the router absorbs it, and then it looks, is this something that is native to Junos or is this something that's custom? And by custom, I mean this could be IETF or OpenConfig as well. 
right? And it does, if it's not a Juno's model, it will do the translation to the Juno's model and then commit it to the database at the back end, which will then trigger all of our daemons at the back end to absorb it. So you configure some BGP policy or some route policy, for example, then the right daemon, the routing daemon at the back end will, will absorb that and then do what it has to, crunch that uh, information, go program the forwarding plane if needed, uh, and then essentially enforce that state into the network. And then when you want to read back that state, the same thing happens. You, you, we have the reverse translation as well. So when you want to read data, today you could do a show command or you could get that same information in the form of an API. That information has a certain syntax and structure. But if you don't like it, you want a slightly different syntax and structure, you can actually define how you want the, your information to look like, again, through models. And we will do the mapping in the reverse direction when we read state. We will map it back to what you, you have decided you want to read from the router. So you can combine different things and have your own view if it makes sense for you to operate your network that way, right? Go ahead, Drew. Is there a mechanism if I'm taking a custom model and it's going through a translation layer mm -hmm. to say, to check and say, did this translate properly? Am I getting the outcome that I wanted from this before I actually yes. pull it out? Yes. So we, the actual, you know, once the translation happens, uh, you will have the same checks and the audit checks that we do when we ingest any configuration that we provide, right? And, you know, Eddie or Nilesh can provide some more detail on this as they go through the demo as well. What happens if there's a mistake in the model, for example, right? Or leading to an outcome you didn't anticipate or, Correct. yeah, there was something that it didn't understand and, yes. So you have the ability to read back the state that you have generated, and you can do an audit post that to see whether the state that you wanted matches what uh, actually has been enforced into the network. And I imagine this would be really important as we have start to have different versions, right? So it's going to be ba the Correct. backwards compatibility yeah. or the forwards compatibility of, of these things. Right. Okay. So so just a brief word on Open Config. Uh, who's heard of or who's not heard of Open Config? Okay. So what open config is uh, really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've had models for a long time. Juniper started with representing all of their devices as models. However, we had our own definition of what BGP should look like internally, or how VLANs are represented internally, right? So that was our definition. Even though we used the language Yang, it was, how, it was our definition of the model. So obviously this doesn't lend itself to a multi-vendor environment because the other guys may have a different implementation of how their BGP state looks like or config looks like. So open config started as an industry initiative. You know, there's a bunch of web scale providers, um, SPs, and a lot of growing momentum on it. They came and said, let's define what BGP looks like, what route policy looks like. Let's come up with these definition and, and share it with everybody in the industry. And you guys now, if you implement that, then we can truly run multi-vendor networks. And that was the goal, right? Being able to run multi-vendor networks so that everybody underneath understands the same language when they provision something on the router. And, and so that, that was the intent. They, they also made sure that the models themselves are decoupled from the transports, how you actually communicate. GRPC is the, the transport of choice, but you could well use those with other protocols as well, right? like NetConf. Uh, and then the other part of it is they've also got streaming or rather telemetry as part of the model. So open config is, the name is a bit of a misnomer because it's not just config, but you can also read state and that state comes back in a model. Model is basically a template with a syntax structure and some semantics. So config and the state both, standard definitions, that's what open config is doing. 